Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Eve, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And I'm real grateful to be here. I want to thank Bonnie and the rest of the committee. Is this one of those microphones when I move over here, nobody over here hears anything? I mean, okay. Uh, I want to thank Bonnie for inviting me to come out here, and uh, I really have loved every minute of it because, to me, one of the wonderful things about this convention or conference has been the fact that, have you noticed it, that it's all been geared to recovery. There hasn't been a drunk log anywhere along the line. It's all been about recovery. And I, I, I think that's absolutely wonderful. But lest there be some here who feel that there might be... I do talk a little bit when I talk about what we were like. Because I'm sure there are newer people here who still wonder about what we are like. Because, you see, that's part of our problem, I think, from the very beginning, and that is we really don't know who we are. And it takes a little time and sobriety to find out who we are. Because all during this period of time that we've been drinking, we've been trying to drink to prove something. And now we have to try and learn that we don't have to do that anymore. And the greatest lesson of all is the fact that we are somebody, even though we may be nobody. Haven't we always been trying to prove that we are somebody? And, of course, we don't have to prove anything. Because once we know who we are, we can be our own God-given self. And that's the real self that's inside. And that's the self that we're trying to find as we walk this path of recovery. And so I will share a little bit of, I hope, what I was like and what happened and what it's like today. And uh, I must start out immediately by saying that I know full well that I wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for Alcoholics Anonymous. It, if it weren't for the fact that I had, was given the gift of sobriety, that I've had the opportunity to grow in the AA program, that I have become willing to make the changes that I've had to make in my life. I'm very grateful they didn't tell me right off the bat when I first walked in how many changes I was going to have to make because I'm pretty darn sure I left. And nobody told me how hard it was going to be either, and I'm glad they didn't tell me that because I'm sure that would have been very difficult for me as well. I was one of those people who from the very beginning uh, was empty, one of those people from the very beginning who felt this terrible feeling of anxiety, this terrible feeling of, uh, of lack, this terrible feeling of inadequacy. We've heard most of the speakers identify to that extent, because that seems to be a part of our pattern, this terrible need to try and find out who we are and not really knowing, and, and the resultant need to, to prove things to everybody, uh, to try and have approval from everybody. You'll have to, forgive me, I have to drink water all the time. I had cancer last summer and radiation, and it dried out my mouth, and I haven't got any liquid at all, so I keep taking it. And the fun thing is that the way I take it, I have had practice over the years. I carry a lovely flask in my handbag. <laughs> it's great fun sitting at AA meetings, and I hook out the little flask and have my little nip. And I see people looking at me sadly and saying, I wonder if that poor old dame is ever going to make it. <laughs> Hearing us all laugh together reminds me of that wonderful thing in the chapter of the family afterwards where it says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. And I think that's the key. And that's what the key to that wonderful seminar yesterday morning was all about. Enjoying life and, and learning how to sense that wonderful sense of abundance and prosperity and love and good feelings. All those things that we felt we wanted to have all during the time that we were drinking and never knew how to achieve. Always reaching out to those things outside. And it wasn't until we got here that we learned that all those things have to come from within. But I didn't know any of that. And, of course, the other thing I think is important for us to remember is that when we speak up here, we're sharing what we have learned through hindsight. If I had known all the things I know today, I, I probably might have been able to achieve sobriety earlier, or I might have learned to be able to adjust myself better. 
So what I have learned about myself as a result of sobriety lets me speak about the past with this hindsight. We're all wonderful uh, quarterba- uh, Monday morning quarterbacks, as it were. And so I didn't know all these things that I share about myself at that time. They are the things that I have learned about myself as a result of being sober in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the things that you've taught me, the things that the program has given me. And so as I started to say, I am one of those people who always had that feeling of lack, that feeling of inadequacy, that feeling of not belonging, that feeling of being unlovable. And, of course, uh, I, I had not much to go with, really. At least I didn't think so. I was very tall. I don't seem so tall today because they've got Brooke Shields on every corner. But back in back in the 19th century, they didn't have Brooke Shields. <laughs> A little late laugh here. Uh, I was very tall, and it made me very uncomfortable. And, and, and I felt awkward, and I was all nose and this big nozzle and the arms and legs and and I didn't know what to do with boys for God's sake I didn't know what to do with boys and nobody told you much back then you had to find it out for yourself (sighs) and it was really rough and so I always had those feelings of inadequacy and not belonging and never feeling a part of and I didn't know that that feeling of separation that I had from the very beginning was based on the fact that I felt separate from my source that I did not have that feeling of oneness with my Creator. And that's one of the things that Alcoholics Anonymous, the great thing that Alcoholics Anonymous has given to me. So I stumbled along through my teenage years, miserably unhappy, a feeling unwanted and unloved and unlovable. And uh, I went off to uh, Vassar when I was 16, just 16, in the fall of 1924. I'll quickly add it for you. I'm 78. You don't have to start (laughs) counting. And when I got up there, I felt so alone and so lost, and my dad had brought me up there. And uh, one of the things that happened there I like to share because somehow to me it is an indication of the way in which we are. It certainly was an indication of the way in which I was at that time and had so so little understanding of and didn't really begin to understand it until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and began to work on the steps. But I I was so terrified of people, and and nobody was going to love me. You know, all those horrible, self-involved feelings that we have, they're so miserable. And and I look back at it, and I realize, you know, how stupid it is. But neurotic fears are just as real as real fears, you know, let's face it. And I was pretty unhappy. And I came down. I went up to my room in Main Hall. All the freshmen were in Main Hall. And I went up to my room, and I discovered that my roommate was a very... Tweedy set, Greenwich, Connecticut. I don't know what compares with Greenwich, Connecticut out here, but it's very ultra. But <clears throat> anyway, I, I looked at her and I thought, oh, oh my God, I'm not going to measure up, you know. And I had all these feelings. But I went back to my father and I said, oh, Daddy, please take me home. I can't stand it here. Please, I don't belong. And he said, you're a big girl. Oh, God, he was always telling me I was his big girl. I knew damn well. <laughs> I didn't need to hear that. <laughs> and so he left, and I went back upstairs to my room to discover that my roommate had requested a transfer. <laughs> well, I want to tell you I had total rejection. Total rejection. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. Nobody's going to want to room with me. <laughs> and I went through this terrible feelings of inadequacy. Nobody wants to room with me. I'm not worth rooming with. And I'm rejection and hurt feelings and all of these feelings. And I felt so low And all of a sudden, my new roommate walked in. And my new roommate was a very nice girl. She had long, stringy brown hair. She wore glasses, had a pile of books in her arm. And I looked at her, and I thought, there's a grind, you know. And, you know, here are all these feelings I've just been going through. And I look at her, and I say to myself, but I deserve better than this. All my life, I was like that. On the one hand, having such tremendous feelings of inferiority, and on the other hand, having such terrific feelings of grandiosity. And why didn't people recognize my worth? 
So anyhow, I stayed on at Vassar. I never drank. That was during Prohibition. Most of you are too young to remember what Prohibition was all about. But it was a law that was passed that nobody was going to drink and that that was going to solve the whole problem about people who drank. And the result was we got a second problem. We got the problem of organized crime, and we still have that. We also still have alcoholism. So I think you can chalk up prohibition as one large failure. However, it did leave us with one very important legacy, and I think perhaps it's the one thing that prohibition did leave us. It made public intoxication socially acceptable for the first time. It became popular to call up your friends and say, how was I last night? <laughs> did I have a good time last night? I did? Oh, hooray. You know, uh, one of the joys to me of sobriety is to know where I was last night. And if I insulted somebody, to know that I did it. And to be able to go and make amends, if they're necessary. Oh. <laughs> Aren't you glad the big book says we claim spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection? In any event, I didn't drink. I knew that I was going to go to Europe at the end of my sophomore year, and I thought I would wait until I was in Europe so that I could drink as Europeans did, you know, graciously, a little wine with the meals, and so on and so forth. And so I didn't drink that first two years. I was at, at college, and of course I was a wallflower. I never got invited anywhere, and if I had been invited anywhere, I wouldn't know what to do. As I said, I was scared to death of boys. I thought they were exciting, but I really didn't know what the hell to do with them. And <clears throat> so anyhow, I didn't have a drink until I was on the ship going to Europe, and at 12 miles out, they began to serve. And somebody next to me ordered an orange blossom. I didn't know what to order, uh, so I thought an orange blossom sounded kind of innocuous. And so I ordered an orange blossom, and when it came, uh, I drank it, and of course, you know what happened. That magic immediately took place. That wonderful magic that we all experience. All of a sudden, instead of being this great, huge, horrible hulk, I was five foot two, eyes of blue, and adorable. <laughs> So, you know, I had found the answer. And that's what we do. We think we have found a solution. As somebody said last night, I wish I could remember all the wise and wonderful and witty things that have been said at this conference. I wish I'd taken notes because there's a lot of stuff I'd like to crib. I like to tell people, I give you credit the first two times, and after that, it's mine. <laughs> I don't think there's anything new in AA. I think we all learn from each other. In any event, I found that answer. I found that solution. And so from then on, I didn't realize that I was drinking in a way which was unhealthy. And nobody else recognized that part of me either. I, I drank because when I needed it, I drank because it was a solution when I needed to be in a social situation. But nobody looked at me at age 17 and said, there goes an alcoholic. Nobody talked about alcoholism back then. Uh, you know, if somebody got drunk, they got drunk. And then everybody was always making excuses, you know. People were so kind about making excuses for you. When I did get drunk, people would say, oh, poor little Eve, you know, her mother died. Hell, my mother died ten years before, and they're still making excuses for me. And, of course, they had such misconceptions about alcoholism back then. I didn't drink every day. I didn't get drunk every time I drank. And so nobody thought I was an alcoholic. Nobody understood that, that the reason I was drinking was to solve those internal problems that I wasn't growing up enough to be able to solve from within. And it wasn't until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous that I found that I would be able to learn how to solve those problems from within and perhaps to grow up a little bit. Uh, that reminds me of an incident that happened many years ago at a, my, my group in New York City, which was the Lenox Hill Group, and it was a speaker meeting. And we had a speaker one night who got up on the platform and said, I have something I'd like to share with you all, if you don't mind. There's something I would like to read. And so he began opening this book, and he began to read a little bit. And you know how we all laugh and share and begin to titter and identify and so forth. And everybody's laughing, and he's reading from this book, and we're identifying and all the rest of it. When he got all through, he said, perhaps you'd like to know what I was reading from. And we all said, yeah, 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 he said. I was reading from Giselle's The Child at Two. <laughs> so I guess there is a need to do a little of the growing up process. 
In any event, I went back to college and I became very, very, very busy, social and so on and so forth, so much so that I was kicked out at the end of my junior year. And at that time, something else happened, which, of course, I think is also indicative, and this is the only reason I tell it, because I think it's indicative of the way in which we act, or maybe I should say react. Because as we look back, let's look at things. We never have really acted. We have always reacted. And I reacted. And when I was kicked out, my father came up to get me. And I remember I felt guilty. I felt remorseful. I felt terrible. Uh, nothing would have made me feel better than to throw myself in my father's arms and tell him how sorry I was and all that. My mother had been to Vassar before me. My sister was coming the following year. And here I had been expelled uh, for drinking on the campus. And I, I, you, you know, I went to college at the wrong time. We weren't allowed to smoke or drink or date. I went to see my granddaughter graduate a couple of years ago from St. John's University in New York. And my God, they drank, they smoked, they had boys in the room. I went at the wrong time. But in any event, I felt real awful, but I couldn't tell my father that. You know, I had to put up that big front, that big facade, that big acting out. And I can remember saying, oh, Dad, if they hadn't kicked me out, I never would have come back anyway. This place is terrible. It's an awful place. And I went on like that. And I couldn't tell him how sorry I was. And that's one of the things I think that we all do. We put up this front so that nobody can really see how we feel because we're afraid of our feelings and we don't want to be rejected. I was so fearful of rejection all the time. And so I left college and I went on <clears throat> to what I, I thought was going to be a brilliant career in the theater. I uh, decided that I was going to be an actress and it wasn't until I got into the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that I discovered what that was all about. I thought I was going to be an actress. And when I found out in the fourth step what that was all about, I realized that it wasn't that I wanted to be an actress, my dears. I wanted to be a star with my name and lights. And I wanted everybody to come rushing up to me and say, oh, I want your autograph, and oh, you're so wonderful, blah, 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 blah. And how many of us do that, that terrible need to try and prove something? Because I think I had that feeling that if everybody else told me I was okay, then maybe I could think I was okay. And we do that. We do that. We constantly strive for this perfectionism, for the pat on the back, for the approval, so that somebody will approve of us, so that we can then think, well, ah, I guess I'm okay after all. Because down deep inside, we have that awful feeling, what's wrong? What's wrong? And that terrible anxiety, that terrible anxiety that we feel, that waking up in the morning with that feeling of doom hanging over our heads, and that anxiety. And that anxiety is what helps us to lose our real selves. We begin to lose our identity. We don't really know who we are. And that's one of the wonderful things about that fourth step, when we get in here and begin to find out who we are. Anyhow, the theater didn't last forever. I was finally let go. My uncle was very kind and told me they didn't have parts big enough for me. And that made it easy for me to drop that one. And, oh, I forgot to mention the fact that I'd already started doing something else we do. I was starting to get married. And I... <laughs> I'd married a handsome young actor in the company, and we immediately have a baby. I won't tell you how many months later. <laughs> And then, of course, I was too immature to maintain any kind of a relationship, so that marriage broke up. So after I'd left the theater, I went around doing all kinds of peculiar jobs, putting on amateur shows, worst thing in the world for someone who was all ingrown like myself to try and do, because the only way I could do it was to maintain that three martini level, which, of course, I never succeeded at doing. It was always one of my goals, but I never managed to achieve it. <laughs> and finally, that job fell through. I had been ill, and I came back to New York, and... Um, I really, for the first time in my life, was kind of panicky about what was I going to do. It didn't all look like it was going to be a wonderful thing with me being a star and all of that, the way I had laid it out and planned it. I've written marvelous scripts. I still have a tendency to write good scripts. <laughs> Unfortunately, they never pan out the way I write them, but we learn. Some of us <clears throat> take longer to learn than others, that's all, and I seem to have difficulty with that one. In any event, uh, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life, and I was rather upset and nervous about it. And I had gone home to my father, uh, my dear father, who was so loving and kind, who did not understand what was going on with me, although I think he began to toward the end. But in any event, <clears throat> I was there, and my sister came in, and she was living at home, and I was just parked. 
but she was living at home with him. And she came home and she said, um, listen, I've got a date. I've got a date with this fascinating man. But she said, I've just got in and I've got to change. Would you mind entertaining him a few minutes while, while uh, I go get dressed? And I said, no, fine. So this charming man came in. And I said, hi, I introduced myself, I'm big sister, and uh, I don't think I said big. Uh, <clears throat> my only way of entertaining was, would you like to have a drink? And so I asked him if he'd like to have a drink, and he said, oh, he'd love one. And I said, well, I'm in my dad's home, and I don't know what he has in the way of mixes or anything. Oh, he said, I don't want to mix, I want it straight. Oh, I thought this guy looks interesting. And... Uh, <laughs> So I served him his drink, and I had one, too. And eventually, he and my sister went out, and when she came home that night, she said, What day did you do to Roger? See, Roger? So uh, she said, All he did last night was talk about you. I said, I don't know. I just offered him a drink. Anyhow, Roger called, and we went on from there. And... Uh, <laughs> I thought we had everything going for us because he, we drank the same way, we felt the same way. I didn't realize that we were two empty people who were wearing masks to put up a front so that somebody else could fill us up. And it wasn't until we were married that we, I was able to discover that we were both the same. I wanted him to fill me up to make me happy, and he needed me to fill him up to make him happy. I had not known that one has to be a whole person before one can bring a whole love to a relationship. And I think that's one of the reasons why we counsel younger people in the Fellowship of AA, not to get involved in an emotional way with anyone until you've been sober long enough to be able to separate those feelings. You know, I think this is particularly true of gals. We have a very difficult time, many of us, in, se in separating uh, the normal sexual process uh, from feelings of love. I mean, how many times have I sat on a bar stool and somebody makes a terrific pass at me and wants me to go to bed with them, and I say, well, isn't that wonderful? I'm attractive. <laughs> and I guess I had done the same thing with poor old Roger. But in any event, we thought we were going to be tremendously happy because really we had a lot going for us. Uh, at that time, I was what you might call an art snob. Uh, I, I could not be bothered with anybody in business. If uh, somebody came up to me and uh, I said, what do you do, or something like that, in polite conversation, and they said, oh, I'm uh, president of General Motors, I would have said, oh, really? You know. <laughs> but let somebody come up to me and say they were an out-of-work actor, or an unpublished writer, or an artist who hadn't sold a picture, and I would think they were marvelous. And so Roger qualified because he was an out-of-work radio actor, uh, or announcer, announcer, I should say. He had been in uh, the radio business from its very start. And the fact that he was now working for his father for $25 a week as a sort of a remittance man uh, didn't seem to sink in that there was anything wrong. But in any event, we did get married. And, of course, from then on, uh, things were not the way I had written the script. Uh, we had two beautiful little girls. My son from my pr previous marriage came to live with us, and you'd have thought we had absolutely everything. But all those feelings of not being able to resolve, uh, of the anger and the hostility and the rage when life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go, the anger that he couldn't stop drinking because I was sure that it was his drinking that made me drink, how quickly we pulled down that, that black curtain of memory and forget the fact that we were kicked out of college, uh, that I was kicked out of college at the end of my junior year for drinking. I forget the fact that when I was on tour once, I landed in a jail in Providence, Rhode Island, because I was put off a train for drunk and disorderly conduct. Thank God for blackouts. I don't want to know what happened on that train. I'm very grateful that I don't know. <laughs> if I thought about it, I could probably guess, but I'm... I'm... <laughs> and so we went through what, what couples do who are living with an alcohol problem without having any understanding of what it's all about. I didn't understand it, as I say. I thought he was my problem. People would come up to me and say, you know, Evie, you're drinking a lot more than you used to. And I'd say, yes, I know. It's Roger. Poor old Roger. He got the blame for everything. But, you know, I learned something uh, after I got sober. And uh, it's a story, I think, that demonstrates um, 
how responsible we are for our own actions, and that's the only reason that I tell it. I used to get black eyes quite often, and of course I always thought it was all his fault. And I remember one morning I woke up and I had two black eyes. And I remember I gave him a nice gentle, uh, you know, in the bed, and said to him, look what you did to me last night. I was always sweet and gentle and loving, you know. And he turned around and said, what did you do to deserve it? Deserve it? I, this saint, this martyr that puts up with you, what did I do? I could not understand that I had anything to do with my own black eyes. I blamed it on him. But let me quickly digress and tell you that I lived with Roger for six years after I got sober in AA, and that he was drunk every single night, and that during those six years, I never had a black eye. Does that tell you something? In any event, I was going through those terrible feelings of remorse and degradation, hating myself. I could not understand what was happening to me. And I kept blaming situations if only we had more money, because, of course, we never had any money. I used to say I lived in New York so I could take advantage of, advantage of all the cultural things there, but we never had enough money to take advantage of the cultural things that were there. And I was blaming uh, the situation and him, places, all that sort of thing, instead of recognizing the fact that... <clears throat> I was my own problem, that my alcoholism was mine. Uh, I, uh, the remorse that I felt was so tremendous, my, my children meant everything to me. I really adored them, and yet I, I know that I hurt them. Uh, and I think that uh, we have to come to an acceptance of the fact that we hurt our children in ways, in fact, in ways in which perhaps we don't even recognize. I'm particularly aware of this for my son. But at the time, I didn't realize it. I just thought that everything was going wrong. Life wasn't the way I planned it to be. I wasn't important. I wasn't famous. I wasn't amounting to anything. I hadn't amounted to anything. I was nothing. And all of it was Roger's fault. And I read the Jack Alexander article in 1941, 1st of March, 1941. It was called Freed Slaves of Drink. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God, how corny can you get? Freed slaves or drink. Oh, God, you know. I was so sophisticated. I guess they cool is what they would say today. <laughs> Back then, it was sophisticated. In any event, I, re I read that piece, but that, that freed slaves or drink, I couldn't understand that. I didn't know what freedom was. I had no idea what freedom was. I wasn't free at all, but I didn't realize that. But he read the article, and he wasn't interested in it at all. And so I thought to myself, well, that's too bad. I guess I'll have to go on drinking with him. Uh, it made no sense to me for me, which is the sad part about it. So we went on, and my son, who was on the, getting to be 11, 12, 13, 14, began to look at me with such distaste. He had great big brown eyes, and, and he'd look at me with, with real hatred and anger and, and rejection. And, and I, it hurt me to look at him and see him look that way. And my little ones I, I loved, and yet there would be times I knew when I would pass out and my little three-year-old girl would be running around the house all by herself. And the little tiny one I would leave in a little canvas swing. That child must have spent half of her first three years in a canvas swing hanging between the living room and the dining room in our apartment on Riverside Drive in New York. She was safe there, but, oh, my God, she was unattended. And so I, I began to hate myself and this feeling of degradation and remorse. That pain that we talk about, that pain became so great that finally I had to come to a point where I had to do something for myself. And I think the crux of it was when my son said to me one night, you know, Mother, I can't stand to come home at night and watch you get drunk. And that hurt me so. And I, and I knew I had to do something. And so I, I, I felt that I must go to AA. I knew about it from that Jack Alexander piece. And then something happened which was very helpful because my mother-in-law came to visit. She was an elderly lady. She'd been well into her 40s when my husband was born, so she was really another generation. But she came, and, and the indication of how far gone I was was in that fact that I was in bed with a hangover, so was Roger, when she got there. And as a rule, I was able to meet occasions, you know, up and doing. And so uh, she only stayed one day. I got myself together and got dinner and so on and so forth. But she left a little note on the refrigerator, and I've never forgotten it, because it said, My dear children, 
the world frowns upon inebriates. <laughs> inebriates. Inebriates. Those of you who don't like the word alcoholic, try inebriate on for size. <laughs> she went on to say, I have written to the Alcoholic Foundation and asked them to send you some literature. And the Alcoholic Foundation, of course, was the forerunner. The name was the forerunner of what we know today as the General Service Office of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've always been rather grateful that my very first real knowledge of AA came from that office, which was going to be uh, so meaningful in my life later on, although I didn't know it at the time. And the pamphlets arrived a couple of days later. Gosh, they were faster then than they are today. And I read this story about a woman, and I realized for the first time that I wasn't the only woman who felt the way I did. I wasn't the only woman who was torn up with anger, who was torn up with resentment, who was torn up with fear and anxiety and rage and self-pity. Oh, my God, how I love to spend a weekend with self-pity. I could really tie one on then. Life was treating me a dirty deal, and I used to feel very sorry for myself. And so I read that piece, and I kind of knew that there were answers in AA. But I was afraid to go alone, and my husband wouldn't go with me. And so I put in, I went away for the summer, but I told my son, I said, my son, I said, Don, darling, I said, I know I'm an alcoholic. And I promise you I will never drink again. And I really meant that with all my heart. And I'd broken so many promises to him, I swore I wasn't going to break that one. But I went on to say that I promise you if I can't do it alone, I will go to AA. And so I went off for the summer with the children up in the country alone and, uh, of course, drank. And by the time I got back to New York, I was finding it very hard to stop. And I finally got back to New York and called Alcoholics Anonymous when I found I couldn't stop drinking. And I walked into my first AA meeting on October 24, 1944. Sadly enough, I didn't stay sober at that point. Uh, life with, a, with, a, with an alcoholic was uh, too difficult for me to handle without enough program to stand uh, me in good stead. I didn't really understand it, and I got drunk over Christmas. But on January 6, 1945, I took my last drink. <laughs> Nothing to it, kids. <laughs> Just get old. <laughs> One day at a time. And, you know, I don't like that word elderly very much. Uh, a little while ago, somebody asked me to do a seminar on alcoholism and the elderly woman. And I thought, why are they asking me to do that? I don't like that word elderly, so I went to the dictionaries I often do for a recourse to find out what I'm talking about, what words mean. And I found a wonderful definition of elderly, one that I use. Elderly is a loss of enthusiasm for life. And I ain't elderly. <laughs> and that... That, my dear friends, is a gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. None of us will ever lose the enthusiasm for life as long as we have this program as a working part of our hearts. I believe that sincerely. Anyhow, I had gone down to the old 24th Street Clubhouse at 324 and a half West 24th Street in New York City for my first contact with AA. And it was a, a funny little building, and uh, as you stood outside, it looked like a long, dark hall. We used to call it the last mile. <laughs> but at the end of that hall was a room, and I could hear laughter, and I could see light. And I was terrified to go in, but I did. And, of course, I found that light and that laughter and life, which is what we find in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I came back then and began to recognize the fact that I needed AA. <clears throat> And that this was the answer for me. I recognized that. I knew that. And, you know, somebody in one of the talks previously talked about not caring how you stay sober. I think it was Ruth yesterday afternoon, uh, what your motivation is. And I, I quite agree. Because my motivation for the first couple of months that I was going to meetings regularly was, uh, I'll show him. <laughs> <laughs> 
which ain't exactly a good motive, but I was going to show Roger because uh, he, when I said I wanted to go back to AA, he said, whatever for? I said, what do you mean? I said, that's my answer. He said, well, you were drunk two weeks, sober two weeks, drunk two weeks, what for? And I was so angry, I thought, I'm going to show him that Alcoholics Anonymous is the most wonderful thing. And so I stayed sober on I'll show him. But I don't care how we stay sober as long as we keep coming around, keep coming to the meetings, keep coming to feel this wonderful feeling of love and sharing that you all give to each one of us when we come in. Sadly, I was so full of fear that I couldn't receive what you were trying to give me. It took me such a long, long time to open up this wall that I had built around myself so that I could receive that love. I was so afraid of rejection. I couldn't dare let anybody love me. I didn't dare love anybody because I was afraid if I did, then they'd reject me. And so I was all wound up in self. And when I first came around, I, I, I couldn't understand the steps Easy does it made some sense to me. I got to put that into my own life, live and let live. I vaguely understood that. And then they told me that sobriety had to be the most important thing in my life. And I said, well, how can that be? My children are the most important thing in my life. And they said, don't be silly. If you go on drinking, what's going to happen to your children? You'll lose them. And I began to recognize what they meant by first things first, that I had to make that commitment to sobriety as the most important thing in my life. And I began to try and make the program of Alcoholics Anonymous a part of me. But it took me a long time. In the first place, I was only allowed by my husband to go to one meeting a week. And uh, I hear people say 90 meetings in 90 days today, and I think how wonderful. But I was always on the outskirts. It took me a long time to get, I'd sit in the back row, uh, as so many of us do when we first come in. And I found it so hard to put my hand out and say, my name is Eve and I'm new. If nobody spoke to me, I sat back in the corner and I could remember crying. I can never cry. Nobody likes me. Nobody's speaking to me, you know. Oh my God. What a mess. <laughs> Listen, if I can get sober, anybody can get sober. <laughs> because I was a real sickie. But I finally began to recognize the fact that I did have to begin to do something to help myself. Every now and then, Roger would go on another bender and be gone for a couple of nights, and then I would dash down and go to a meeting if I could get my son to sit with his little sisters. And so I began to recognize the fact that A was a very important part of my life. And I began to slowly try and make the program work for me. But I didn't really understand a great deal of it. I was really very, very disturbed. But it wasn't until I finally was able to get out and do some 12-step work that I began to recognize the importance of what the program was as far as I was concerned. Because when I sat behind that desk at the intergroup office in New York as a volunteer one day a week, which became the most meaningful day in my life, I realized that when I was talking to new people, I didn't have very much to share because I hadn't really and truly come to grips with the program for me. And so then I began to try and make the program work. I began to try and work the steps. I began to make those changes that were important as far as I was concerned. See, the first step had never been any problem for me. I was so darn glad to know I was an alcoholic. I thought I was insane. I thought I was crazy. I thought I was mentally retarded. I thought I was degenerate. I thought I was all those things and to discover that I had an illness which was treatable although they didn't actually put it in those terms back in those days, but that it was at least recognized as an illness, made me feel terrific. I was really very happy to find that out. And so uh, I, I had no trouble with the first step, at least that part of it. Of course, I did think at the very beginning that the reason my life was unmanageable, the only reason for it was that I drank, and that once I stopped drinking, I could manage my life. <laughs> it took me a little time to find out that that wasn't wholly true. <laughs> and came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, I could recognize that, oh, because I had, to, I had to let AA be that power at the beginning, but I could see the power in these rooms. I could see the power and the love that was being poured out. And so I began to accept and understand that second step. And I was not to know until much later on how tremendously meaningful that step had come uh, to me. The third step I had a lot of difficulty with. The third step, I, I didn't know who God was. I didn't understand what my God was. And I misread the step, so I didn't make the decision because I thought I had to know who I was turning my life and my will over to before I made the decision. And so I kind of groped around with that step. But I, I was willing, I thought, to try and find out what God was all about. 
And then I went on to the fourth step. And the fourth step to me was such a tremendous one. To really begin to find out who I was. To learn what my motivation was. To come to accept the fact that I wasn't all those things I did. And I say so often to new people, don't confuse what you did with what you are. Because what we did was the illness. What we are is this real self inside that we're going to find as we do the fourth step. As we begin to learn who and what we are. As we begin to learn to love ourselves. As we begin to learn to forgive ourselves. And when I was trying to do my fourth step, I had such trouble because all I could remember was the terrible things. All I could remember was the awful things that I had done. And I kept stewing over that. And I remember at a closed meeting one night, Marty Mann was at meeting that night. And she said, Eve, you're doing all the wrong things. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I want you to start looking at the good things in yourself. Start looking at your assets. Don't keep looking at all the things that are wrong. You're trying to build on those. You've got to begin to build on those assets that you have. And I was always so grateful to Marty for sharing that with me because I have found that that's tremendously useful. Too many of us find it so hard to forgive ourselves. And the reason that we can't forgive ourselves is the fact that we don't see all those good things that are deep down inside, all those God-given things that that make us the, the real and wonderful person that we're capable of being. And so I began to try and work on my assets. And I began to recognize there was good in me. I began to recognize how much I loved my children and that I chose to love them, that I really cared about them, and I began to build on that. And when anger and resentment and hostility began to interfere with those, then I could begin to see those were things I had to get rid of. And so I began to slowly find this, I hope, real self that was within me. And so I began to work on the fourth and the fifth step. And, of course, when I came to the fifth step, I didn't trust people yet. I found it very hard to trust. I didn't dare tell anybody in AA everything or they'd kick me out. So I kind of divided my fifth step up a little bit at the beginning until I could begin to trust people. Uh, And so finally, I was able to take on on the fifth step. And the sixth and seventh, thank God, I began to get the willingness. I began to get the willingness to change. And I think that's such a key factor. We have to have that willingness to change. And I was finally given that. And the making of amends is such an important thing. The making of amends, making a list, and be willing to make amends. I'm terribly sorry, but I feel very faint. Let me sit down just for a minute, if you will, because I think that I I have to. I don't quite know why. This has never happened to me before. There's a first time for everything. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, right. Uh, let me just try and finish. It's not on, is it? Yeah. Can you hear it? Oh, okay. So my effort is primarily in the way in which I live every day. The way in which I act and react with the people around me and the people that I care about. Uh, it does, this, does this sound? Can you hear? Oh, okay. And so I began to try and make amends. Of course, I did all the wrong things. You know, I was going to make up for the external things, rush out and buy beautiful little velvet dresses for my daughters and say, see what a good mummy I am. And, of course, that really wasn't it at all. And with my son, I've tried to make amends over the years. And sadly, he and I have not had too much communication with each other. But I have got communication with his children, my grandchildren, and I'm so grateful that I have that because ours is a very loving relationship. And so I've tried to make amends to those people that I've hurt. But as I've said, to me the important thing in making amends is the way in which you live each day hereafter. And so we come to the tenth step, and the tenth step is the one that keeps the program vital and alive in, with me every single day. That because business of being prompt, admitting promptly when we're wrong. Somebody talked about that in the last couple of days too. How promptly we admit that we're wrong, and if we can do that quickly, how much better it is than to let it fester and go on feeling badly about it. And the inventory at night. What did I do that I could have improved upon? And even after 41 years of sobriety, there are so many nights when I say, "Oh, I wish I hadn't said that." And as, as I said before, thank God we claim spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection. I'm so glad we're not perfect. 
It would be so terrible to be perfect, wouldn't it? There'd be no other goals. We'd have nothing else to achieve. It would be terribly boring to be perfect. I'm so glad that I've got lots to still work for. And the 11th step was a wonderful step for me because the 11th step helped me to begin to understand about my higher power. So through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. And I did a lot of reading and studying and trying to understand what my higher power was all about. And, you know, I didn't really know and I didn't know how to pray. And like so many of us, I was so self-conscious, so terribly self-conscious. I was convinced that if I got down on my knees alongside my bed, that everybody in the building in the courtyard across was all looking out the window saying, Look at Eve on her knees! Of course, nobody could even see in the window, but that's the way I felt. You know, Phil talked a little bit about that last night, too. We get so self-involved. But I began to recognize what they were talking about. And I remember once I had an experience which made it so very vivid to me. I was terrified of subways. And in New York City, you can't get anywhere without riding in the subway. And I generally took buses or walked everywhere. But I had to go all the way to Wall Street. And the only way I could get there, unless I wanted to spend a whole day getting down there, was to take a subway. And I got on the subway, and I began to panic. That terrible feeling of being closed in, that claustrophobia. And I began to have the awful feeling of panic. Uh, I guess I'd been sober a couple of years. I don't know, maybe a year only. But anyhow, I thought to myself, oh, God, I've got to do something. And so I kept saying, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact. And I went over and over the, the 11th step in my mind. And it was the most incredible, the most amazing thing. The palpitations stopped. I start feeling panic. I stopped feeling panicky. And I took that long subway ride with a feeling of peace and comfort. And I began to understand what it meant. And I said, if you can pray, you will be, begin to have that feeling of at oneness, that feeling of comfort. And I began to go back to work on the third step and to recognize that I needed to turn my will and my life over to a power greater than myself, regardless of whether I knew what it was or not. And the 12th step, of course, putting these practices, these, putting these principles to work in our daily lives and carrying the message. And I've had so many magnificent opportunities to do just that over the years. I have so very much that I must be grateful for. When I look back and I think of all those years that I felt so sorry for myself, and after I'd been sober for a little while and I'd worked as a volunteer at the intergroup office, they finally came to me and asked me if I would go in as the paid secretary. Well, it came at a very fortuitous time. I'd been in the, the program almost six years at the time, and Roger and I had just broken up, and I had no way of supporting myself. And here was a job being offered me in AA. Granted, it was a pittance as far as money was concerned. AA jobs don't pay very good as a rule. <laughs> Much better now than it used to be, as it should be. In any event, I, I went to work at, at the intergroup office, and very often some of the gals were there. They would say, hey, listen, we're all going out to a meeting tonight. Let's go on out and have a good time. We'll go to a meeting, have dinner. And I would say to myself, oh, I can't. i got to go home. My kids, my kids, i got to go home. And I felt so sorry for myself because I couldn't go out and have a, quote, good time with these kids, uh, with the friends, because of my kids. And I'd get over and get on the bus, and I'd head up for home, still feeling sorry for myself. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much. Isn't it wonderful I'm in the habit of chugger lugging? <laughs> All right. By the time I got up to the corner of 97th Street and Riverside Drive where we lived, and I got off the bus, and I looked up, and there was a big bay window in the apartment. And I saw my little girl sitting in this bay window, and I could almost hear them as I'd see them excitedly jump up and down and say, Here's Mommy, here's Mommy. And I learned how grateful I needed to be that I had those beautiful daughters. Because if I, had, if I had not stopped drinking, I would have lost them. And I learned to be so grateful that Roger was an alcoholic. And I had so resented his alcoholism and the fact that he wouldn't get sober. I had resented it for so long. And now I had learned to be grateful. Because if he had been a normal drinker, he would have taken my children away from me and I would have lost them. And then I began to recognize the fact that those gals that were out having a good time were living in furnished rooms. Their children were with their fathers. And that I had so much to be grateful for. And you know, love is the power of love is, has been the theme of this convention. And to me, love is what AA is all about. And love was the one thing that I was afraid of. 
Love was the thing that I didn't know how to show, that I didn't know how to share. Based on my terrible fear of anxiety, that loss of identity that I had suffered as a result of my alcoholism, and therefore that fear of rejection and that fear of loving, the fear that it wouldn't be returned and of measuring love. Do you love me more than you love so-and-so? You can't measure love that way. You like this soup better, that's all right, but you don't love more than one person than another. But I hadn't realized all that, and I began to recognize how important love was, and I had learned to be able to love people. Mostly I had learned to be able to love people because I had learned to love myself. It's most important that we understand that. As I said before, that what we did is not what we are, that that's a part of the illness, and that self-forgiveness and getting over the feelings of guilt are a terribly important thing if we're going to stay sober. And it's only when we've learned to love ourselves that we are able then to be free enough to learn to, live, to love other people. Because it, it, love is a two-way street. It's like breathing, and you don't stop and say, now I'm breathing in, now I'm breathing out. You know, it just happens. And love is receiving and giving both. And we don't stop and measure it anymore. And that's the commitment. And love is a commitment. But it, doesn't, it has no return. It not, has no thought of any return. And that's the way my love for my children was. There was no thought of any return. But you know, love is a wonderful thing. It has a wonderful way of always coming back to you. You may give it out here and it may come back over there. But we don't measure where it's coming from. But this last year, last uh, May, uh, March, a year ago, I discovered that I had cancer in my neck. And uh, so I had to have radiation therapy for about 10 weeks every day. And I got very, very ill as a result of it. And my daughters, both married, they live fairly close. One lives 70 miles away, one lives 20 miles away. It's close. But anyhow, it's like the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. On Saturday, Ruth would leave and Liz would arrive. <laughs> the following Saturday, Liz would leave and Ruth would arrive. And this went on for the three or four or five weeks that I was uh, so sick that I could not care for myself. And after they'd left and I was beginning to get better and could handle my little needs and take care of myself, one day I found this tremendous sheet, this fool's cap, this yellow sheet. And I looked at it and I thought, what is this? And here were these things written on here. And I recognized both girls' handwritings on different sheets. And one of them would say, uh, she's been rather depressed. Uh, she isn't eating very well. I tried to get some pasta with some consomme and she liked that. I've done the laundry. Don't let her watch so much TV. <laughs> I should tell you that I have two beautiful daughters that have grown up to have one in AA and one in Al-Anon. And so as I read down this list and one little note said, don't hover over her. Let her do things for herself. <laughs> I thought, that must be my Al-Anon daughter. Yep. You know, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? How things happen and how things come true. My older daughter came running down the hall one day when she was about 11 years old. She was all excited. She said, oh, mommy, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And I said, what do you want to be, darling? Oh, she said, I want to be a ballet dancer and a member of AA. <laughs> and I know why she said that. She felt all that love that surrounded our household once Roger and I were separated, because from then on, AAs were in my house every day. She felt that love. She wanted that. She didn't want the pain. I'm sure she didn't ask for that. But she got it. And today, she has nine years of sobriety and alcoholics. And alcoholics. You know, one of the things that saddened me over the years was the fact that these two girls, who have meant so much to me, whom I adore, hated each other. They really couldn't stand one another. The fights were terrible. I used to pray on Christmas morning that we get through the day without some eruption taking place. And then my youngest daughter decided to go into Al-Anon in order to deal with her sister who was drinking by that time had become obvious. And also she was going around with an AA guy at that time. 
And so she got pretty active in Al-Anon. And then, of course, Ruthie got sober in AA. And the two of them together, each working their own program, Al-Anon and AA. About three years ago, those two girls came together in a beautiful healing. And they not only love each other, they're friends. And I'm so grateful to Al-Anon, as well as to Alcoholics Anonymous. AA has been a tremendously important part of my life. Not just from the point of view of program, which of course is essential, because I have learned, I hope, to be able to put these principles to work in my life. I have tried to make Alcoholics Anonymous a viable and active part of my life on a day-to-day -day basis. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love this fellowship. I think the gift that we have received from this is so tremendous. But you see, I have so much more to be grateful for because I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work closely within AEA. I spent 17 years at the General Service Office after I left the Intergroup in New York and had the opportunity to work at that heartbeat of Alcoholics Anonymous, that central point uh, to, to work with the staff there and to watch AA grow around the world. I've been excited by AA's growth around the world. To see AA developing in faraway countries, and I began to get so curious. I thought, oh my God, is it really working? I can't hardly believe it because I was often on the overseas desk. And so I, I began to get curious, and I thought, oh, I've got to go and see. I've got to go and see. And eventually I did have a leave of absence from the office for a whole year. And I used that year <clears throat> to travel around and visit Alcoholics Anonymous in all these faraway places. I've sat in meetings in Singapore, I've sat in meetings in Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Germany, France, Spain, Norway, England, you name it. I've sat there at AA meetings in Japan and listened in a foreign language when I didn't understand the words, but know by the expression on their faces that they were finding the kind of happiness and contentment that we have found in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But for Pat, I want to tell one story because it was mentioned the other night. And I went to Australia, and Australia, unfortunately, at that time was going through one, to me, of the most inhibiting factors in AA growth, growth and that is super anonymity. You never knew anybody's name. You never knew where to find AA. They were so afraid somebody would know where they were. <laughs> and I would be introduced to people like, this is Bowtie Harry, and this is, this is Racetrack Alf, and so forth. And I never knew who anybody was, and it, it was very confusing. And finally, I, had, I was doing a lot of speaking, of course. I was still at general service at that time. Although I was traveling independently, I was not, uh, general service wanted everybody to know I wasn't representing them. Because they, we didn't want to have anybody think I was going to try and tell them how to do anything. But anyhow, I did try and share a service experience because it was needed in some places. And anyhow, we had had this wonderful service meeting uh, in Adelaide, Australia. And uh, the next day at the airport, there were a whole lot of people who had come to see me off. And I thought that was really sweet of them. And uh, I saw on the desk as I went to check in at the counter of Ansett Airlines, which was the internal airline at that point in, in Australia, I saw this envelope with the name Marsh written on it. So I reached over to pick up the envelope, and this man behind the counter said, Just a minute. And he took the envelope back, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. Well, he said, I just wanted to know. He said, Are you Eve M.? And I said, uh, yes, I'm Evem. Do you know a Ted F? <laughs> so I turned around to the people behind me and I said, do I know Ted F? And they said, well, yes, he was in the chair last night. Oh, I said, yes, I know Ted F. So the man then smiled and said, well, oh, all right, Mrs. Marsh, you were the only M on the manifest, so we thought this must be for you, but we weren't sure. And he tore open the envelope and handed me a telegram addressed to Eve M., Ansett Airlines, Adelaide, Australia. <laughs> now, I submit to you that that broke my anonymity a hell of a lot more than if they had addressed it to Eve Marsh. <laughs> Anonymity is the spiritual foundation, but let's not hide. Let's not make it difficult for people to find us. Let's show the world that recovered alcoholics are worthwhile people, that we can recover, that we stay recovered. I know I've heard people say, oh, I could be drunk tomorrow. Not on your life. 
Not if I have this program as a viable, wonderful part of my life today, I'm not going to be drunk today. And so I don't believe, I think we can be recovered. And the big book says we are recovered. However, our recovery is dependent upon the maintenance of our spiritual contingent, uh, contingent upon the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And that's the reason we need to keep in touch with our source. That's the reason we need to come to a grips with an understanding of the fact that our source is what we've been separated from and that now we can be joined with our source. That we can find that real self, that divine self, that inner divinity, as Shakespeare said, the divinity within which shapes our ends. And that's what AA gives to us. And AA has given us back those beautiful people that we really are and can be and have always wanted to be and thought we had lost and didn't understand why we had lost them. Because now we know that we are one with our source and we are one with our fellow man. And when we look into each other's eyes, we can see that power greater than we are shining back at us because we do see God and love in our fellow man. Because that's been the lesson, I think. The lesson of love, the lesson of sharing, the lesson of becoming one. You know, there's a terrible word that is used so often. I think it's a terrible word. Uh, maybe with my gray hair I can have a bias or two. But anyhow, that word atonement, that sounds like guilt, you know, atonement. I like to break that word up because that's what we find. at one at one at one moment, because we're back to our source. And it's all said very simply in the book of John, God is love, who dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in him. And, oh, are we not blessed. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.